What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Sequence. I'm your host, Trevor Plouffe, and today we have another very special guest with us today, 2006 MVP, four-time All-Star, two-time Silver Slugger, batting champ, Justin Morneau, the pride of Canada. What's up, dude? Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to doing this. Yeah, we. I mean, look, we go way back. You were one of my mentors, a guy that helped me immensely in my career. So I thank you for that. But we've had a ton of ball talk. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of like get into this and show the people like just how in-depth my man can get into hitting because you definitely can. Yeah, sometimes I think I made it more confusing than I ever needed to. But <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about it the other day. It seems like the guys who had the simplest approach last a long time because they were able to be consistent with it. But you know, you try and do what works for you. So, yeah, and but I do think you had a pretty simple approach as far as your hitting. Um, you were definitely a hard worker. Like you were in the cage more than anybody. And whenever anybody asks me, like you know, how was it to play with Justin and Joe? And it's like you kind of approach the game mentally the same way, or maybe, maybe not. Joe's a different cat, but you were in the cage a lot. Joe was not in the cage a lot. I tended to lean on your side. I needed to work. I felt like if I didn't do it, that I was not going to perform well who like where did you get that from was that something that you've always had or did someone uh, mentor you and kind of teach you how to prepare well my dad threw me I don't know probably a million balls but we used to hit a ton in the summertime I mean I remember that was what we did every day we my mom went back and she was finishing her degree she was a teacher so she went back and during the summers to finish her degree. And so we'd spend the summers with my dad and didn't have a whole lot of money. So what's the thing you can do that doesn't cost anything, go to the park and hit. And and so we go to the, you know, little league diamond, go over there, set up the pitching machine and we would just hit for, for hours. I mean, it it was just, it was, it was, I don't know. There was nothing else I wanted to do. I mean, I remember we got a, we got a little pitching machine. It was called a little buddy it was you lined it up with wiffle balls. My brother and I got it. I think I was three and he was probably five at the time. And we used to load that thing up with wiffle balls and we used to hit off that thing. And that's the first thing I remember, but I don't know. I just remember I always loved hitting and I always loved playing hockey. And it was one of those things where I remember we got the first Nintendo when it came out and I probably played it for 15 minutes and then decided that I just wanted to go back outside. So <laughs> I was, I was just one of those kids that, that would way rather be outside. We always, we had a, you know, we were in a neighborhood. We had a group of friends that loved to play basketball and, and street hockey. And it was harder to find kids that play baseball and play wiffle ball, but we had enough. We usually played two on two in my backyard. And, and uh, you know, we had these, these huge trees, these evergreens in left field that we called the green monster. And then the porch for the house was in right center field was deep. It was uh it was one of those things, you know, you do that growing up and then you step on Fenway Park and you're like, wow, I saw this on TV and I played here in my backyard in my imagination. But uh, to get out here and actually play was was something really special. I remember my first time there and it, it's a it's a special place to me. I always love to hit there and I always feel like I hit well in Fenway because I pretended Fenway was my backyard for so many years. And not that I was a Red Sox fan or anything like that, but it's just such an iconic place that they did that so you know my parents my parents were always there i never had the type of parents that were overbearing or i never felt like they were counting on me to make it so their life would be good it was just you know i signed up for sports and they'd take me or friends parents would take me and my parents for sure my mom never watched me practice baseball or hockey 100 percent. she was never on the sidelines doing that if there was games at home she would come to the games but you know, she was taking care of two boys and, and working a full time job and doing all that stuff. So, and I never thought anything of it. I never looked over and thought, "Oh man, my mom's not here." It was just kind of I was there. I got to do my thing. I had the freedom to play sports, and mm-hmm. you know, my dad was there when he coached, and he would come, you know, to as many games as he could. But, but it was one of those things where I was just fortunate. I never felt that extra pressure from my family to to make it. I, I wasn't signed up for hitting lessons when I was eight years old. I, I had my dad obviously teaching me how to hit, mm-hmm. but. You know, the first time I hit in the winter, I think I was 17 years old. So (laughs) it's one of those things where I don't know. I I think, yeah, I wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and, and it, you know, it was just instilled upon me from my parents. And, and that was, that was about it. So I don't know. We have a, we have a, we have a lot of kids that watch these shows and they love to get the insight from big leaguers. And it's fun 
to hear you say that. I had a similar experience growing up. Um, I played a lot of baseball, but never was forced into it. Never felt like I needed to, you know, perform or do anything. It was just fun for me. And uh, a lot, a lot of times now, like I talked to parents, I even coached a uh, my son's t-ball team so i got to see kind of the way things are going now and everyone wants to specialize in baseball and do all these lessons and stuff and and really it's it's refreshing when you hear stories like yours or or when i say you know how my upbringing was it's like this is supposed to be fun for the kids it's probably where i developed my i mean i know it's where i developed my love for baseball probably where you developed your love for baseball because it was just fun yeah, it, it was all i ever wanted to do it, yeah. i mean it was literally if it wasn't baseball it was hockey and if it wasn't you know, in my backyard. See, that's, I think that's the difference now is I probably took as many swings as other kids growing up, but they weren't under the watchful eye of, uh-huh. of some hitting guru or some, you know, someone in a batting cage for 80 bucks an hour. It was in my backyard and we were imitating stances. And when I was growing up, I mean, Griffey was the best player on the planet and, and, you know, it was a two hour drive from where we were at. So we used to occasionally go down, usually when the Blue Jays came in town and, and go down to Seattle and watch games and, and, you know, Vancouver is part of the Toronto Blue Jays market. So Toronto has all of Canada captured. Mm-hmm. So growing up, the Blue Jays were good. They won a couple World Series. And and John Olerud was the guy that I watched a ton. So it's it's funny because I had this guy that I kind of looked up to and I watched hit probably more than anybody else. He was left-handed like I was. I never thought I was going to be a first baseman. I always wanted to be a catcher. But, you know, he was a guy that I, I imitated in my backyard. And I remember we were playing – the Yankees in the playoffs in 04 and they did this side-by-side comparison of his swing and my swing and it was almost identical except for the fact that I finished with one hand and he finished with two it, it was it was eerie how it happened and I never ever looked at his swing and said that's what my swing is going to look at look like I just imitated different guys and my swing kind of morphed into a clone of, of Olerud swing almost it was it was a it was a really interesting thing but you know so i that's how i did mine you know my my training growing up was by myself i was learning my own swing i love to do it because it was something that you're never going to perfect it but you're always trying and, and and i think that's what i enjoyed about it it was a new challenge every day of just trying to get better and trying to find my swing and then because I did so much on my own, I was able to correct things on my own as well. So it wasn't every time I went into, I got into trouble. Now, I mean, obviously that first call was usually with my dad, but <laughs> every time I got in trouble, I had a way of, of correcting myself because I knew my swing as opposed to someone else telling me how they thought I should swing. So I think that's important too for kids to understand is every swing you take doesn't have to be under the supervision of someone else. You can, you can take swings off the tee in your, in your basement or hit into a net in the backyard, or, you know, you can play wiffle ball with your friends, whatever it is. I mean, you don't have to have someone watching every swing. You find out who you are by hitting on your own. And, and mm-hmm. that's kind of how I found who I was. So, so you, you mean, you take all these swings, you have success in baseball, you get drafted by the Minnesota twins, you get put up in the minor leagues with none other than Joe Mauer. And you guys are like, The talk of the town, you know, since the beginning, right? I mean, you guys put up some big numbers. Joe was the number one overall pick. All of a sudden, it's like the Eminem boys coming up. And what's so cool is you guys room together. You guys learn from each other. You win an MVP in 06, and Joe wins it in what, 08 or 09? Yeah, 09, yeah. And you were runner-up in 08. Like, what a a cool uh, story. Like, did you guys talk a lot of baseball? Like when you, you were know, back at home in your apartment after games, were you guys talking baseball or was that not part of it? You know, what's funny is for how many years Joe and I played together and we used to ride into the park together, even when, when I, you know, we weren't roommates anymore, we would take this trip in, we'd stop at Jimmy John's and we'd do whatever we wanted to do on the way to the ballpark. But we never got in depth about hitting too much because his approach was so simple and so yes. different than mine that what I learned a lot from him was poise and composure and, and how to deal with failure and pressure. And I mean, he was in the spotlight from the time he was drafted as an 18 year old, everybody in Minnesota knew who he was. You know, you could Mm -hmm. identify him easily. He had the sideburns, he had everything. And and, I mean, he literally couldn't go anywhere. I loved going places with him because I would be left alone and everybody would, you know, go up to Joe and he had time for everybody. I mean, there's so many lessons I learned and, and him being a couple years younger than me, very rarely does that happen where you look up to someone Uh who's a couple years younger than me and i I really looked up to him for 
the patience he had for the guys waiting outside the hotel at two in the morning trying to get an autograph when you just got off a, a three hour flight and, and you're sitting there and you're frustrated. All you want to do is go to bed and get your suitcase and go to bed. And, and you know, he had patience for everybody all the time. It was amazing how well he handled himself. So that side, you know, of the ball, I learned from him. We had conversations, but you know, I, his approach to me when I talked to him about it was so simple. It was, he didn't want to swing at anything off speed until he got to two strikes because he didn't figure that pitcher could throw him three off speed pitches in an at bat for a strike. You know, he couldn't throw consistently. He wanted to prove that that guy could throw him three nasty sliders or three curveballs in the zone. And, you know, most of the time if they throw you strike one with it, they're not going to throw it to you strike two. They're just trying to get you to chase. So his approach was stay on the fastball, try and track the ball as long as he could see as many pitches as he could. And, and for me, I felt like I saw more off speed than he did. So there was times where I had to sit off speed. I had to, you know, make adjustments through an at bat and, and his knowledge of the strike zone was better than mine. So it was, it was one of those things where he never got himself out on borderline pitches and me I'd going up there trying to, you know, pull homers and drive the ball in the seats and do that stuff. I would, I would chase and I would chase a lot. And, and, and it was, it was one of those things where I'd sit there and go, man, I wish I had that type of patience at the plate, but we were just two different hitters. And, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if he really learned anything from me, but I know I learned from watching him and, and his at-bats and him hitting yeah. in front of me for so many years. I was going to talk about you, you and Mauer being a little bit of yin and the yang. Um, <laughs> cause, because he had to learn some aggressiveness from you. I mean, he, that's kind of in his nature to be calm, cool, collected, like you said. You know, he was, he's okay with taking uh, a, a first pitch strike, getting deep into the into the counts, but – you know, at some point, a guy like Joe had to make an adjustment and times he had to be aggressive. And I'm sure that he learned that from you because that's kind of, not that they were overly aggressive, but you were much more aggressive than, than Joe was at the plate. See, I don't know. I, whether he did or not, I'm not sure. It's, it's one of those things where there was times I remember specifically where we were at the, at the dome and I was hitting behind him and he's leading off the inning. He goes, he throws me a first pitch right here. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take him deep. And then he went up first pitch, pulled Homer. I'm going, that was one of the most, like guys do it all the time. Like, oh, he hangs me one. I'm going to get him. He never said that type of thing. And then he said it, and it was like instant Homer. And I was like, why, why don't you do that more often? But I mean, he, he understood who he was as a hitter. He was over a 300 career hitter, you know, 400 on base percentage. He had great at bats and he was consistent in his at bats. And, you know, for, for him, it was, it was, he had success doing things a certain way. And, and until it was going to be proven that that didn't work, yes, he didn't feel the need to really change anything. So I'm sure he watched me, but I think the other thing he probably saw too, is some of my at bats where I'd make weak outs, you know, on a first pitch change up roll over to second base. Cause I'm, I want to hit that fastball so bad. And then I get fooled. So I think, you know, you see that as well and you go, okay, that's a bad at bat. That doesn't help our team. He didn't learn anything from that. So there were certain things that were, we kind of fed off each other in that way where it was, you know, I learned patience from him. Maybe he saw me being aggressive and he saw certain things he could pick up, but you know, our routines were so different. Everything was, I mean, he had to prepare for most of the time when I was there was to prepare as a catcher and, and mm -hmm. you know, he had to do everything. He hurt his knee early in his career. So he did, he started doing, you know, he did daily exercises to keep his knee strong and to keep everything around, you know, where he had that, that injury to his knee, he had to keep all that stuff strong. So that was part of his routine and my routine while he was doing that was taking a thousand swings. Yes. So it was, it was just a different, it was a different approach to the game and he had to get a pitching staff ready and he had to get game plan with his starter. And, you know, he had to go through that other team's lineup and while he was doing that, I was probably still hitting. So it was one of those things <laughs> where you were a ball of sweat in the cage or watching your Homer bids. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but that's what I felt like I had to do. For me, a lot of my confidence came from my preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, if I felt like I was strong, I put in the work, I, I spent my time in the off season in the weight room and, and you know, worked on my swing and, and worked on whatever weaknesses I wanted to work on, that's when I felt prepared. And I think, you know, the mistake of, of tying in confidence with success can be very dangerous, especially in baseball where you're going to fail most of the time. So if you're out there going, okay, I was one for three today and I'm the greatest hitter on earth and, and now I'm over four and I struck out three times and I'm the worst hitter on earth and, and you're tying your confidence into your results, that's when you get yourself in trouble. But if you, it took me, it took me 10 years in the big leagues to finally get to this point, but 
I finally would line out somewhere, you know, line out to second, hit a ball in the screws, do everything right and not get the result I wanted. I was finally able to look at it and go, okay, it just didn't work out. I prepared, I got a pitch I was looking for. I didn't miss that pitch. As opposed to earlier in my career, I would, I would line out to second and go, if I would have just hit that ball higher, I would have got a hit. Or if I didn't hit it right at the second baseman, and, and it's impossible to go up there. I mean, yeah. unless you're Ichiro or, you know, some guys that, that could really manipulate the ball. For me to go up there and try and change the swing, even though everything was right, everything was perfect, I, you know, ball, we didn't have the exit velocity and all that stuff to back up it. But, I mean, you hit a ball 105 off the bat and, you know, second baseman snags it. You don't come back feeling bad about yourself. Yes, you would like to get a hit, but if you're able to get over it and say, and everything I did there was right. I just didn't get the result I wanted. That it's a lot easier to deal with the failure and to move on as opposed to, you know, tying everything into having success and, and doing, you know, the results based way. That's how you get yourself in trouble. It took me a long time to figure that out. I wish I knew that earlier in my career. I would have saved myself from turning over twelves into over eighteens or over twenties. You know, it, it's, it's, it's funny. It's tough though because you need results. Like you have to yes. have results to stay in the game and have a long career, but what you're saying is absolutely true. It's like, trust the process. The results aren't going to be there every year, every at bat. Like you might line out to the second baseman 10 times. And in another year, those might just sneak past them for hits. So yeah, it does take a long time to get that. I totally agree with you. And it's hard. And if see, and that's what I feel like we're talking about, you know, Joe and I being different hitters. I feel like he had that from the first day he was in the big leagues. He trusted his process. He knew his swing and he understood that if he was consistent with that process, that his results were going to be consistent. And, and, and he never really wavered from that. And, and, you know, for, for me, I, I went through different, different ways of doing that. But when I finally got to that point, it's just so much easier to sleep at night. It's so much easier to, at the end of the day, look yourself in the mirror and say, yes, I worked hard enough today. Yes, I did everything I, I, in my power to try and help us win a ball game. And, no, it didn't work out, but you know what? I'm going to get another shot tomorrow and I'm, I'm going to come back and work just as hard and, and hopefully get the results that I'm looking for. So that's why baseball is the toughest game mentally, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, what's cool now, and we didn't necessarily have this when you and I played together was a lot of the expected stats, you know, like, like you're saying, if you hit a ball in the screws and it's an out, like you can go back and say, okay, well that was, you know, uh, expected 700 batting average, you know, ball. And you can see in your peripherals, like I'm, the results, the batting average might not be there, but I'm doing the, I'm doing it the right way. Like I will get those hits eventually, you know, and that's something that a lot of guys now can rely on. Like, yeah, okay, this is where I need to be, even though I'm not, I was 0 for 4, but I probably should have been 2 for 4. That's a little bit easier to swallow than just saying, dang, I was 0 for 4. Like, I, like you said, I wish I would have hit that ball just a little bit higher. Yeah, so, this is like the moral victories of the, you know, you go through these times and it's like you get off to a slow start or whatever it is and you you start digging yourself a hole and then you start trying to change things if you have someone bring it to your attention hey you know you've barreled more more balls than you did last year you just aren't hitting them in the right spot it's it's a lot easier to go oh you know last year in the month of april i was you know i hit 380 and slugged you know 600 or whatever it is you know i was on fire and and then you look at oh this april i'm hitting 200 and i'm you know slugging you know, 380 and going, what's wrong? And then all of a sudden somebody brings you a sheet that says you've actually hit the ball more consistently this year than you did last year. You're just not getting the results you want. I think to me, if I had that early in my career, I would look at it and go, all right, I don't need to change mm -hmm. anything. I just need to take a deep breath, continue trusting the process, continue trusting the work that I'm putting in. If I'm not getting myself out and I'm, and I'm making adjustments and I'm doing everything I can do. I mean, to me, that, that is, is huge. I, I'll talk to our guys in the, in the front office about that and say, you know, what's, what's different here? Is anything different? Is he pulling the ball more? Is he, you know, whatever it is. And, and they'll go, no, I mean, he's just not having any luck. And, and yeah. you know, the way we said it is, oh, he's hitting into bad, some, some bad luck. Well, now we have evidence that a guy's hitting into bad mm -hmm. luck. It, it's like, okay, well now, now I can sleep. Now I can live with it. Now I don't have to make a drastic change to my approach or my swing. I just need to start having some luck. And, and there's a lot of that involved. There, there's two pieces of advice that I got in my career that I'll never forget. One kind of ties into what we were just talking about. Prince Fielder I got on first base. Um, he's in Detroit. 
And he's like, hey, Trev, what's up? How you doing? It was early in the season. I was like, man, like, I, I'm going, man. I'm trying to get going. Like, you know, my numbers aren't where I want them to be. But uh, he turned around and goes, dude, it's the end of April. He goes, don't worry about your numbers until the end of the season. Like, you are who you are. The numbers will be there. Just trust that. And I thought that was really cool to hear him say that. Like, it's to me, like, it rang true because you are who you are. Like, yeah, you're going to have to make little adjustments here and there. But if you're going just results-based, like we were talking about, and you have some bad luck and you start to change your swing, then things can snowball. And it's like the best hitters make small adjustments, not the biggest ones. And they can kind of weather the storm doing that. And if you think and have that mindset, like, all right, just keep going, trust the process. I think that, for me, like, led to a lot of success. And I think that's kind of what we were just – touching on right there see to me i always once i started to think of it as a you know i like playing hold them we always played on the plane and playing in the room on the road and everything else you know so i'd think of it as a as a poker game what do they tell you in poker the best poker players don't worry about their hand they worry about the other guy's hand so you know your hand obviously has to be decent so to me that was my swing all right what's the other hand well that's that pitcher and that catcher what are they doing to trying to get me out so if you could figure out what your opponent has or what your opponent is trying to do to you, what you have doesn't really necessarily matter if you're able to figure out what they have. So, you know, to me, it was a way of, of looking at it in a different sense of I, once I get my swing to where I want it to be, I don't need to change my hand position or, you know, my hip, whatever, when my mm-hmm. foot's getting down, all that stuff. Once that stuff's locked in, it's just, it just becomes a, a poker game between you and that pitcher and the catcher. And, and I don't know, that to me – is where it's fun. And when you get to that point, that's when, you know, the game really, really becomes something different and, and it starts to go to another level. And, and, you know, I got to that point in my career and, and man, it was fun to be able to, to be able to sit there and, and, and play that game of, all right, last time he got me out on the change up, whatever it is, you know, this time he's not going to beat me the same way twice. I'm not going to get myself out on that or whatever it is. And, and, you know, I, I had a lot of fun doing that once I got past the constant mechanical changes in my swing and was able to just settle on something and not make it results-based and, and make it process-based and, and, you know, things took off. It's a little bit of foreshadowing for this at bat. I have the second best piece of advice I ever got. It came from you, but I'm going to save that for our second at bat. And I remember that day. It was in Yankee Stadium. I'll see if you remember it too. But well, I- we walked in left field, but we'll take a look at this first. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you said like you got to a point where it was more of just wondering or talking and thinking about what the pitchers got for you. In this particular bat, we're in Detroit. Um, I don't think I was up for this. I think I was still in the bushes up and down, but I do remember the game. Max Scherzer on the hill. Second at bat, I believe, was when you took him up top, 3 1 change up. We'll have Kyle clip that in right here. It was a bomb. So now you have that in your mind, sitting here in the top of the seventh. He's still in the game, in a jam here. Don't really know why he was pitching to you, to be honest with you, but you know, I'm glad he did. And uh, let's kind of uh, let's take a run through this at bat. We'll start it up right now. All right. All right. Baby more or not a baby more. This is a thick more. No, a little bit older. Max so baby you said Scherzer. took him deep on a three, one change up. So I'm, I'm sold out to the fastball right there. I'm, I'm 100%. He's not throwing me another change up, especially first pitch right here. And then I missed it. You can see the reaction. Yeah. And you know, some of that was for myself and just a natural reaction. And then some of it was for the pitcher and the catcher to see like, Hey, Ooh. I try and play that mental game of, Hey, you got away with one. I don't like do that, that again. You know, I was kind of now he's out there thinking he beat me with that pitch. So what does he do? Okay. He comes back to it. And we saw Victor Martinez behind the plate. He, he was in Cleveland for so many years. So kind of learned what he was doing, but he made a mistake there. That was actually a better one to hit. Yeah. he So, so he tried to come up and in, like you said, you kind of okie doked him right there. You're like, oh man, he beat me. Challenging, essentially challenging him to come back with another fastball. He wanted to get it up under your hands, but definitely left it over the plate here. Yeah, this is a this is a mistake pitch right here. It's definitely not where he wanted to throw it. No. And now you're like, dang it. And that one, but there were some of them like so sometimes I would foul the ball back like that, like the first pitch. Mm-hmm. And it would be right above the pine tar. But I would try and act like I just missed it. You know, like <laughs> like he got away with one. And I'd try and play some mental game when I was sitting there of 
you know, how, this guy, you got away with a pitch right there. And, and maybe I didn't want him to throw it again because it was off the pine tar. So then I would, you know, try and get him to get back over the plate because I was a guy who liked to get his arms extended and, and you know, tall, you know, six four. So the hardest pitch for a tall guy to hit is up under their hand. So that's the last thing I want to see is him keep doing that. So we go through next pitch. All right. Yeah. I say, oh, I'll call oh, it. You got, I'll call it non-competitive. Okay. So we get to here and, you know, I hit his change up out earlier in the game. So he's throwing this as more of a, a split type change where he's going to try and strike me out and, and make sure he doesn't miss over the plate and in the mm-hmm. zone. But for me in this part of his career, I felt like I saw his change up really well. I can see that because when I'm watching these at bats, it kind of comes out so differently. He, well, to me, he tried to get so much fade on it that so when I when I was looking at a pitcher, you know, I think it was Tony Gwynn said he'd look at the label on the hat and then transfer to the release point. So me, I was trying to see the ball as deep in that release point as I could and try and see hand movement. So for me, he turned his hand over mm. a ton to try and get that ball to fade down and away to a left-handed hitter. And I saw that early because to me, his, his arm action and his arm speed on his fastball was different than his changeup. So, so his, that ball would, would kind of pop out a certain way and I would see it and it would just sort of fade on me and I would see it early. So it was one of those things where I, I felt like the only pitch that I was really uncomfortable with was that fastball up under my hands and I needed to be ready to hit that. I felt like if I saw his changeup, I would have enough time to hold on and use my lower half and to keep my hands back to be able to take advantage of that changeup. So I had confidence against the guy, one of the better pitchers in the American league at the time I had confidence against him. And, and it was just because I felt like I saw the ball well. And I think yeah. the other thing I'll say about that, when you face aces, when you face number one, they're guys who have confidence, they challenge you, mm-hmm. you know, they're not out there, you know, nibbling around the edges of the zone. They're not out there. They feel like they're better than you. They feel like they've got, something that can get you out. They feel like they can beat you. So then they, they come right at you. That's why I love facing Scherzer. I love facing Verlander, you know, Roy holiday. I, I, you, know, you know, there's yeah. certain guys that you knew it was going to be a tough day and you had a good chance of, of getting an 0 for four, but, but you knew they were going to come at you. It wasn't, they're going to try and trick you and fool you and get into a two O count and, and, and throw something that you're not expecting. You know, so they kind of went through this whole, this whole mental game of, of I enjoyed that part of it facing these guys. It was, it was always a challenge facing the best and he was one of the best, but I felt like I saw the ball well off him. I totally get what you're saying about his fastball. I mean, if you look here, like, you know, fastball grip, and then if he's, if he's turning the change of over, I'm trying to get in the screen, you know, you're going to see more of that palm, just a bigger area to focus on. Yeah. So So it was, it was a different look from his hand. So I was able to, I felt like I was able to recognize it. All right. So that was a waste pitch. Um, one, two now you're locked in. It's probably the only game I was locked in that whole year, but so this one, a <laughs> little misfire it's like, you can see his arm speeds a little, he's got more confidence in his fastball. He's, he's got more conviction in his fastball. He was so trying he to comes blow at you. And, yeah. It, it's like he, 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 he's going to beat you with his best pitch and he understands his best pitch at that time was, was his fastball. <laughs> We were watching this earlier. I said, oh, there goes an RBI right there. Every hitter that's up there, there's a pass ball. You're like, oh, like I'm happy we scored a run, but. A little different with two outs, though. Yeah. You know, with one out, that's that easy sack fly. You're out there going, all right, this this guy's with two outs, a little different story. But so non-competitive change up 0-2, fastball way off the plate, you know, 1-2. Then he comes back. What are you you thinking? What are you thinking here? Because you can go so me, I'm just trying to think, stay on the ball. I, so with two strikes, a lot of times I would choke up. So I was a guy who was off the bottom of the barrel, and then I would move the barrel, you know, the knob of the bat below my hand. Most mm-hmm. of the time it was in my grip. Two strikes, I would move it down, and I would try and stay on the bigger part of the field to give myself a chance to hit more pitches. At, at that point, I made myself a little more vulnerable to a fastball up and in, but I felt like I could cover fastball away. I could cover – slider, curveball, changeup, whatever it was, if, if I, you know, focused on the big part of the field when I got to two strikes. So for me, okay. the way it was taught to me early in my career is the first two are for you, the last one's for the team. So you have two chances, you want to try and go deep, and then you get to two strikes. Your job is to to try and make an adjustment and, and put the ball in play and, and try and give yourself a chance to get on base. So yeah, especially that was the, the runner mint. on third, too. It's like, you know, a lot of people yeah. now say A swing all the time, A swing all the time. Well, you know what, dude, like when there's runners in scoring position, you know, I learned from you. You learned from Miguel Cabrera. Like, just get the job done, dude. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You're not always going to take your A swing, especially against a, a number one like that. You're, yes. 
you, it's not available. You have to have some other way to, to either keep an at bat alive and foul off tough pitches or whatever it is. And if you make a mistake and the guy makes, or your guy makes a mistake over the big part of the plate, you're going to get your A swing to it. You're going to recognize that pitch. Your eyes light up. You see it immediately because hitters know what a center cut fastball looks like or a hanging changeup looks like when it's on its way to the plate. I mean, you recognize that almost immediately that it's coming into that, that zone where you, where you hit the ball well. So you have that. And then it's the areas around that where you kind of keep yourself alive. And that's the difference between, you know, being a 240 hitter or a 280 hitter is, yeah. is fouling off tough pitches or being able to hit borderline pitches and not only survive on your strengths. And so if we get back to it here, he goes, this I'm, one's I'm a little guessing, better. I'm guessing change up. I don't remember what it was. Well, see, I know I try not to guess with two strikes either. I try to give myself a chance. So this was a little more of a check swing because this ball started inside. Yes. So you see me check on it. And the reason is, is because I was aware of that fastball in that first two pitches in the at bat, he beat me with the fastball. So I think, okay, I hit a home run on a changeup. He's probably going to try and throw me something hard to blow me away. So that was a very smart pitch right there. You mm -hmm. go soft down and in because that left-handed hitter, that hip flies open a little bit sooner. You make up your mind a little bit too soon and you end up chasing pitches like that. So that was a smart pitch. So he goes to that and then I end up taking it. And then I get to 3-2. And you remember the previous at bat where 3-1 you hit a change about. Now here, are you sitting dead red then, or do you still have that in your So mind? I stay on the fastball, yeah, with two strikes out here. 3-2 was a tough count for me, especially with the base open. And, you know, you sure, try not to yeah. let that stuff play into your head, but you're going, all right. Base open for sure, you have to think about that here. One run game. You up there. Probably the last hitter he's going to face. His pitch count was up over 100 at this point. So there's a lot of factors that go into it. And you still uh, got the win going right now. Things. What's that? You still got the W too right now. So <laughs> yeah, in my exactly. mind, I'm thinking, dude, this guy doesn't want any part of you. But let's get to the pitch here. But he's a number one. He's going to challenge you. See the money maker. There's D-Span. 3-2. D-Span on third. They already took one of your RBIs away. And here we go. <laughs> Whack. Tries to come inside, misses Leaks. that spot. He had mm. a lot of tail on his fastball, even in mid-90s. So this one ends up, he's trying to come in, and you see it late. It runs back over. But I feel like the only reason I got to this pitch is because I was up off the end of the bat. If I'm, if I'm down off the bottom of the barrel, I don't get the sweet spot to it. So because I gave myself, or I felt like I gave myself a little bit more time mm. by choking up on the bat, I was able to just take my hands to it and let him provide the power. And it was, it was a simpler swing. You know, the first two swing or the first swing was a big swing, fouled yes. it back, you know, kind of fell out of my, my balance. My front side kind of came off and, and I looked like I was mad, but I missed it because I probably, you know, wasn't as short or wasn't as compact as I was with two strikes. So there's a big difference there in what I allowed myself to do. Now, obviously this ball center cut, but, it's still, you still have to get the barrel to it. That was still above the belt. You know, you take an extra long swing or big swing on this. See, that's, that's just letting the ball travel, trying to, and then trying to just get the barrel to it. And then it ends up, you know, working out. It was, it was one of those things where you just have to trust your hands and you have to trust your approach. And, and I always felt like I, if I was able to do that, then I was better off. And, and, you know, I would go through times I talked to Rod Carew about this, you know, with two strikes, he's, he would look at you and go, why do you change with two strikes? If it's successful with two strikes, why don't you do it all the time? So it was one of those things that I kind of battled with because, it, yeah. you know, you have a Hall of Famer, one of the greatest hitters of all time, say something like that to you, you kind of question and go, that does kind of make sense. So then I went and looked at it. I think I hit almost as many home runs with two strikes as I did with less than two strikes. So it did make sense. And, it, and I did actually... In 2008, for almost the entire year, I, I hit that way up off the barrel because I felt like the previous two years, I had a lot of success off left-handed pitchers by thinking opposite gap to their fastball and giving myself a chance to stay on the breaking ball. I felt like in 08, they started throwing me in a lot more, and I didn't want to have to cheat to it, so I took that two-strike approach and, and switched for a year, and, and, and then I went back the next year for some reason. But it was one of those things where – I felt like I had to make some type of adjustment because they were adjusting to me. So yeah. I don't know. It's an, it's an interesting thing that, and you said at the beginning, <laughs> there's a lot going on up here during my at-bats and 
and thinking about my swing and everything, but that's how I kind of looked at it is, is, you know, if you're able to adjust, you can stick around a little bit longer. If you, if you have one swing in the same spot and you keep getting out the same way, you're not going to last very long. And, and I think, you know, that was, that was something that I tried to do was adjust as it went along and making an adjustment with two strikes allowed me to have success off a guy like, like Scherzer. I love it. I mean, we talk about that all the time. Like you have to be able to make adjustments. You can't just have one swing and you're like a living embodiment of that. If an MVP says, I got to make an adjustment because the league's making an adjustment on me. Guess what kids? Like that's what you got to do. And I think the other to- funny thing about this, sorry. Okay, go ahead. I was going to say the other funny thing about this is, you know, Jim Leland, one of the best managers of all time, saw him at the batting cage the next day. You know, we're taking BP. He comes out and full spikes, everything like he did. And he comes out and he says, man, I, I kind of had like that little, try not to look arrogant, but I kind of <laughs> had that little smirk on my face. Like I got you last night. He comes out dead straight face, no emotion whatsoever. I shouldn't have let him face you last night. <laughs> I'm sitting there going, he goes, I hadn't left you ready. I don't know why I let him fit. You already took him deep. That's There's funny. no way you should have had that bad. I, bring I was the wondering lefty. the same thing. He goes, I bring in the lefty. It's game over. <laughs> <laughs> no credit for the homer off Scherzer. No credit. Who it was, was just, the lefty, though? Because you never know, man. I'm trying to think. Who I don't even remember. Phil Coke, was, maybe, was, or something? No, it wasn't Coke. It was, uh, I think they showed him at the end of this club. But it was one of those things where it was, it was, the only reason I had success was because he made a mistake. <laughs> there was no credit being give, given to the other team's hitter. I just thought it was one of those things. I was like, That's oh, funny, Skip, you're man. the best. Yeah, it was, it was good. I, I, never, I didn't take it as insulting. I took it as him just having so much pride in, in his thought process as a manager. But he stuck with his ace, yeah. and it ended, up, it ended up costing him. I mean, he'd throw the ball well. He was one of the best pitchers in baseball, and he stuck with him. It didn't work out, but you know, it was just a funny to hear his thought process after that. I love Jim, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on, running through this at bat with us. We're going to do one more with you. Uh, catch Justin as the color commentator on Fox Sports North for the Twins games. Every single time you're on the broadcast, I just get an influx of tweets like, Justin Renault's the best. We need more. We need more. We need more. So you're doing a great job, uh, which is not surprising to me because you know the game so well. So I appreciate you coming on, sharing your insights, and we'll be back with at bat number two with my man Justin Morneau. Hey guys, it's Trevor Plouffe coming to you live from vacation to tell you there are 100 million reasons why you should listen up. DraftKings, the leader in one-day fantasy sports, is celebrating the return of sports by giving away up to $100 million in prizes to all of their customers, including one lucky winner who will take home a $1 million cash prize. To claim your share of up to 100 million in instant giveaways, all you have to do is download the app and sign up using promo code JOMBOY, and then enter DraftKings free football survivor pool. Yes, it really is that easy to claim your share of up to 100 million in instant giveaways and put yourself in the running to win a $1 million cash prize. While the top prize is reserved for one lucky winner, Everyone who signs up and enters DraftKings' free football survivor pool will receive an instant bonus of at least $5 in value upon entering. While you're in the app, don't forget to check out all of the great daily fantasy contests DraftKings is hosting for this week's basketball and golf action. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code JOMBOY to claim your share of $100 million in instant giveaways and put yourself in the running for the $1 million cash top prize. That's promo code JOMBOY, J-O-M-B-O-Y, to get your share of $100 million in prizes only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Sequence. I'm your host, Trevor Plouffe, and back for at bat number two, our guy, Justin Morneau, number 33. What's up, Justin? We do, Plouffe. I'm doing good. We just went over an awesome bat against Max Scherzer. We talked some Maurer. We talked some Jim Leland. We talked about Prince Fielder giving me some cool advice. And I said, next at bat, I'm going to try to remind you of something to see if you remember the advice that you gave me because I will never forget this day. We were in New York. It was a day game. And you called me out and you said, come do come run with me. That was your routine pregame on a day game was to go out there and get your legs under you sprint a little bit. So you inform me that they had just designated Luke Hughes for assignment and that it could have been me. And 
right then I was like, I freaked out a little bit because I was in the big leagues. I hadn't done anything, but like that was my dream. I was there and I was just kind of happy to be there. And throughout that process of getting ready, you were just explaining to me like, look, man, if you want to stay here, you got to change some some things up. You got to change your routine up. And again, I just remembered being like shocked that Luke was gone. You telling me this. And I was like, I'm going to listen to Justin Morneau. That was 2012. Fast forward like two weeks from there, I get an opportunity at third base. They sent Valencia down and I went off. And it was because I was preparing with you and I was. I remember. I remember like it was yesterday too. I didn't know you actually remember that or not. I mean, I had <laughs> oh, I conversations did. with a lot of people over the years. I don't know if, how many of them tuned them out or not. But yeah, I was DH and I remember that I was still DH in that first part of that year. And that was my routine was to run. And I remember talking, I remember talking about preparation and routine and how important that was. And, you know, I, I appreciate the fact that you remember that. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. But it, it was one of those things where for me, the routine, when I, once I settled in on my routine and I figured out what that was, what I needed to do to get ready, then it was easy. If I was struggling with something, you know, specific, I could, I could add that into my routine or I could work on one thing, but I knew exactly what I needed to do to get my swing where I want it to be. And, and, you know, for me, you know, so many kids, once they get out of T-ball think they should never hit off a tee. And yeah. until the last day I played in the big leagues, I hit off the tee every single day. If I did nothing, I hit off the tee. So that was my first thing. And then I did flips and, you know, I added in flips and then I would change speed on the flips as opposed to just hitting fastballs. I would go back and forth on those things. And, and, and then I would try and face some live arm. And, and, and then if I was struggling with left-handed breaking balls, I would turn the machine on and, hit some of those left-handed breaking balls to force myself to track the ball or anticipate the break or whatever I wanted to do. So I could add that in if I needed it. And then once I felt like I was seeing the ball well or that came back, then I would go back to my routine and, and keep it simple. And I think for young players, it's so hard to know what that is, what you need to do to get ready to play 162 games in, in the big leagues. And, and And I think the other thing I remember about that conversation was telling you that you never know when that opportunity is going to come you have to be ready for when that day is and then you take advantage of it. And even though you're not, I think I said, even though you're not playing today, you don't know if somebody's going to get hurt or you don't know when that opportunity is going to come. And, and yes, it might not look like you're going to be able to get at bats because of Valencia and whoever else, you know, guys are there, but no team stays healthy for the entire season. You don't know where that opportunity is going to come and when it's going to come. And I'm glad to see that you took advantage of it and got yourself a nice career and, now we're talking about it. Yeah, no, it's cool because yeah, like you're saying, I I didn't see a way for me to get at bats. I wasn't playing a lot. I hadn't even I hadn't earned at bats anyways. I knew that. So it was difficult for me to see a path forward and sure enough, you know, spot start here, did well, Valencia gets sent down. I got c- cemented into the lineup and I took advantage of it, but you know, that was a big that was the turning point in my career. So I've thanked you a million times, but thank you again. <laughs> um, so a lot of, a lot of um, people now talk negatively about the tee and what they'll say about the tee. You mentioned you hit with it every day. So did I. So do most big leaguers. What they'll say about it is you can manipulate your swing. And to that, I say, good, duh. <laughs> like, <laughs> of course you can. You know, you don't need, like, you can manipulate your swing on flips and BP. You can manipulate your swing on any of the routine-oriented stuff because that's what you're supposed to do. And that gets lost with a lot of the online hitting coaches now. It's like, you know, you got to do this, got to do that. It's like, no, dude, you have to figure out what works for you in that given moment and and go. So it's uh, it's refreshing. We It happens every single time I have a hitter on. It's like, that's the thing they say is that you have to figure out what works for you. There's not one way to hit. There's not one way to do things. And people need to hear it over and over again because it's true. And right now there's so much special specialization going on with youth hitting that uh, I think they're getting away from that. Well, you watch a big league game. You find me two hitters that hit the exact same, even where they start with their hands or their lower half or their width of their, you know, mm. before they stride where their guy hits with a leg kick, there's guys that look similar. And when you get to contact at all, gets to pretty much the same point. Yeah. But how you get there is, is, is different. Yes, there's ways to be more efficient, but not everyone's body works the same. Not everybody's strengths are the same. So like I said at the beginning, 
you have to figure out who you are as a hitter and what your swing looks like and what it feels like and and what's comfortable. I, I think that's the the first thing my dad will do when he has a you know somebody learn how to hit is say, all right, put the bat on your shoulder. Now take it off your shoulder and put your hands where you're, where it feels comfortable. And then that's how he starts their swing. He never says it has yeah. to start here or here, whatever it is. He starts with the simplest approach of if you're not comfortable, it's going to be really hard to hit. So you want to start in a position where you're comfortable and you go from there. And to me, the T, the T did so many things for me that, that you just can't do with BP or flips. You can have the best BP thrower in the world. They're not going to be able to throw the ball exactly where you want them to every time. Mm -hmm. So for me, I wanted to be able to cover, you know, I'd start away, I'd hit the ball the other way, then I'd move, go middle, then I'd practice pull, and then I'd finish away because I knew the majority of the pitches I was going to see were going to be on the outer third of the plate, the outer two thirds. So I wanted to feel like I could cover everything out there. But the other benefit of the T to me is if you're getting beat by fastballs up and in and you go and you turn up that pitching machine, you crank it up and you're getting pitches up and in and you're having to find some way to get to the ball. Well, if you know exactly where the ball is going to be, you can figure out how to get your barrel to that ball if it's sitting on a T. The T eliminates all the variables and it leaves you only with your swing. Mm -hmm. Where the ball is going is, is up to the person who's throwing it, whether it's flips or BP or off a machine. It's hard to get that ball consistently where you want it to be to work on something. So for me, I, wanted to, I always wanted to work on my strengths. I practiced driving balls to the left center because that's what felt good. And when I was on, I felt like I was staying on the ball and that was everything that I did. So to me, the T, if I could only do one thing, it would be the T. It wouldn't yeah. be all the other things. Yes, it's going to be hard to hit velocity. Well, sorry. I'm, it's, I'm gonna... it's, it's low impact too. I think that's because if you put that machine up and you're trying to go up and in, you're just going to jam yourself. It's going to be a rough. Yeah, you get you know, frustrated. You start popping yeah. the ball up in the top of the cage. You start getting jammed. Then you start flying open. So if you're off the T, you can figure out the depth of contact where you need to hit that ball, yeah. you know, up and in. How far out front do I have to get my barrel to actually get to this ball? How, how much do I have to rotate to feel comfortable to clear my hips and, and get my hands to this ball? I mean, there's so many different ways to look at it. And, and with the T, it just sits there. I, I think this, this some, made something click in my mind. But when I signed with Colorado, with the Rockies, I, their complex was close to my house. So in the winter, I, I went there and, and worked out at the complex. And when I was hitting off the T... I started trying to do a lot more visualization. I started trying to prepare myself mentally. Every swing I took off the tee, I tried to look out at the pitcher and envision a pitcher on the mound. And that pitcher was Clayton Kershaw. I'd never faced Kershaw to that point. He was one of the best pitchers in the game and, and still is very good. But at that point, he was in his real dominant run. And I knew if I wanted to be successful, I had to find a way to get hits off him. So I would picture him on the mound hitting off the tee. And I would picture him throwing me fastballs and I would go through his hesitation with his leg kick and he would come at me. And, you know, I had this whole in my mind of what it looked like when he was going to be pitching to me. And I would hit his curveball in my mind off the tee and I would hit his fastball and look at his slider and, you know, whatever else it was. And the first couple of times he started against us, I uh, got the day off. I finally started a game again at home against him. And it was probably the most comfortable at bat I'd had because I took 5,000 swings off him off the tee in my mind before I actually faced him in a game. Love that. And I didn't you know, go, oh, you can look it up. It was 0 for 3. Well, I had two really good swings. I think a diving play was made on one of them. I hit a fly ball behind second base that was a mile in the air. I mean, that was one grain away from being a homer yep. dead center. And I, I just felt comfortable. And that was because off the tee. So – Yes, if you're just putting a ball on the tee and you're just swinging over and over and over again, yes, you can get nothing out of it. But you can alter your timing off the tee. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hit fastballs. You can get your foot down, hit a fastball. You can get your foot down and, and slow, you know, however you think you're going to hit an off-speed pitch, you can go through that. For me, it was holding on with my legs. So there's so much that the tee can do that, that you don't – that you can overlook it very easily because it seems like it's how you teach little kids how to hit. Well, it's also how big leaguers hit and it's also how – you know, guys, guys can, can get certain things out of it. You can get as much out of anything if you're willing to, to find a way to get out of it. And, and to me, there was, a, there was a mental aspect to hitting off the tee that, that really helped me feel like I was becoming a better hitter every day. So, Well, that's what you do well in the booth uh, that I've noticed. Um, for a long time, there's been guys 
in the booth and there still are like around the league they're old school they don't they want nothing to do with anything new they don't want anything to do with analytics they they hate the word launch angle and exit velo which is weird to me because launch angle is just the angle the ball comes off your bat and exit velo is how hard you hit the ball there's it's not new concepts they're just new terms for these concepts and they can measure them a lot better than they used to be able to but you do a good job of mixing the old school like we're talking about the t here and the new school like you've been able to learn you know, different things they're doing um, to prepare. You know, there's a lot of different drills, different ways to do things now. And like those things are okay too. Like you, like you're saying, you got to be able to find value in these things. You can't just shun things because it might help you. There's a PVC drill where these guys are doing this. They have a PVC pipe and they're kind of like, you know, getting their back elbow in, they're kind of rotating. And people dismiss that drill like, oh, that's so stupid. But like, why is it stupid? It's getting you a feel. Like if that's going to help you, do it. It's the same thing with the T. If that's going to help you, do it. And 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 to and both sides are to blame here. In and you're not on Twitter, but hitting Twitter is wild. You have one group of new guys that says anything old is bad, and then the old guys say anything new is bad. And I don't understand that. Like there is value in both. Like there, you do have to make an adjustment. Some of these new drills do work because guys are pitching different. They're living at yeah. the top of the zone a lot more than they used to. So that's one thing that if people tune, tune into Fox Sports North, they're going to hear you kind of combined old school with new school, and it's so refreshing. It's See, so I, refreshing. I talked to my, Michael Kadair, and I talk about this. You know, People say, would you want to know this stuff? Of course I would want to know the information they have now. Yes. If there's a chance that it can make me better or if there's a chance that I can have an edge when I'm in the batter's box of what this guy's going to throw or how he's going to try and get me out, Yes, I would want to know that. Would I want to know that I slug 800 in a certain part of the strike zone and that's probably the area I should look for? Yes. To have success? I mean, there's certain things that are very useful. Exit velocity is good. I mean, launch angle to me is just a different way of saying something that we've been saying the whole time. The difference in our generation or when I came up was that you didn't want, you know, a little middle infielder trying to hit the ball in the air because they were going to be outs most of the time. So that was the difference is now I feel like it's okay for everybody to try and hit the ball in the air. It's, it's opposed to, you know, if you can, if you can run, use your speed, hit the ball on the ground. I feel like that mentality for the most part is gone, but we were trying to hit the, the pitch. So the way, the best way it was put to me is you're trying to hit the L screen from the guy throwing BP. You're trying to hit the L screen. Yeah. And that's like the optimal launch angle, basically. That's what we were trying to do in BP anyway, was trying to hit backspin line drives. We just call it backspin line drive. Mm -hmm. And then it would carry in the backspin. So if it was a miss, it would be a homer. If it was a miss down, it could still be a hard hit line drive or ground ball with topspin. It's almost the identical thing as, as talking about launch angle. You're just saying it in a different way. Yes. So I'm not opposed to those things. And, and, and I don't think I should be. I mean, we know things now about the swing and the way the body works and, and everything else, the way the ball comes off the bat that, we didn't have information before. And there's old school baseball people that can see these things without knowing them. You know, you have scouts that have been scouting for 30 or 40 years, mm -hmm. don't need a radar gun. They can just look and go, yeah, that guy's throwing 95. Yeah, that guy's throwing 91. I mean, they're, they're so good. They've seen so many players that you can't discount that either. Now, obviously, you're going to have your radar gun on and you're going to write your numbers down. You're going to do all that stuff. You're, you're going to get your spin rate info and you're going to do all the rest of that. But, but to me, you can't cast aside a whole generation of people just assuming because they don't talk about it the same way that you do. You might know the same thing, but you not, may not be speaking the same language. I mean, one guy speaking French and one guy speaking <laughs> Spanish and, and, and neither one of them understand each other, but they're basically saying the same yes. thing. So it, to me, it's one of those things where it's, I talk to my dad about this all the time. He still teaches hitting lessons. He's, you know, 72 years old and he has young people all the time telling him he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> And I'm going, okay, have any of these guys coached a, a batting champion or yeah. you know, MVP or have what's their credibility compared to yours? You know, I, I don't understand how people can just dismiss what he has to say just based on his age. I mean, age and knowledge or, or experience to me trumps all. You can have all the information you want, but until you've actually stood in there and tried to do it, that's the difference maker to me. And, and so – Yes, there's different ways of teaching things, but there's also there's a blend of the two, like you said, that are that are that are perfect, and and you can find a way, because no two hitters think alike, no two hitters hit alike, 
So you have to find what works for each guy. And to me, teaching a, a cookie cutter approach or one way to swing isn't the best way to do things. You have to figure out who you have as an athlete and who that player is and, and what they're able to do and what they're capable of. So that's the simple way of looking at it, I think, in my opinion. We, we might go down a rabbit hole here, but the one thing that, <laughs> that kills me is uh, spin rate. I, I, I think it's been the, the, the biggest advance in technology and, and, and its impact on baseball has to be the, the slow-mo edgertronic cameras. Because, look, the term spin rate is just, like I said, it's a word that describes what baseball players have been talking about forever. The guy's got life on his ball, late life, whatever. Like you knew what you knew when you saw it. If a guy had plus spin or a plus efficient spin, you knew. But we didn't have a way to um, talk about it or even measure it. But now we do, and I think we're seeing well, guys. We, we measured it. We measured it with our eyes. You faced Verlander when he came up. Oh, my. He's throwing 98 at the top of the zone. That's life. He, had, he could blow you away. Yes. We saw it with our eyes and we come back and go, it's got life through, life through the zone or whatever it is. I mean, whatever term you want to use, it's the same thing. Go ahead. But the guys who are able to now use these cameras also use the sticky stuff that we know every single buddy's, every pitcher is using or they should be using. You know, if they can continue to be more efficient with their spin and up their spin rates, I mean, that's why you're seeing all the strikeouts and you're seeing these balls move like crazy. Because these guys are learning how to manipulate the ball on, with their fingertips, all because of these slow-mo cameras. <clears throat> I've said it for a long time. Pitchers are benefiting from technology and these, uh, the analytics way more than hitters are. It's been very – it's a slow climb to, to try to get back on par with the pitchers. And right now you're seeing like Bauer, who's kind of been the guy who led the revolution almost – He's he's like top spin rate with all of his pitches, and he's absolutely dominating now. So it's um, it's a weird thing, man. But I think uh, you know we're seeing the adjustment now from hitters getting to that top of the zone. So now we're seeing the pitchers zag the other way, and guys are starting to throw their two seam. They're trying to x the corners <laughs> again, like they used to. And it's just a chess match, man. And that's the beauty yeah. of baseball. It's funny because we we were talking about that during a broadcast. You know, last time I was on, it's like, are we going to see this evolution go back the other way of now the guys are finding a way and they're getting away from that uppercut swing to be able to counteract that sinker, you know, trying to lift the ball at the bottom of the zone. Well, you can't attack a ball in the top part of the zone like that because you're going to swing under it. You're either going to pop it up or you're just going to completely swing and miss it. So guys are making that adjustment. They found a swing that works to get to that ball up in the zone. And I was watching last night and it's like, it seems like every mistake that is between the letters and the belt or maybe even mid thigh ends up out of the ballpark. Mm -hmm. I mean, guys take advantage of those. It's like, if you don't miss letters to above the zone, you're going to, it's going to be a homer and, and guys have swings that are just tailored to hit that ball in the top of the zone now. And now I, I feel like, like you said, we might see sinker cutter, you know, working the bottom part of the zone, a lot more ground balls. And, and, and then on top of that, you have the shifts, so yes, you have guys, yeah. your benefit is trying to get the guys to hit the ball on the ground with weak contact where, where your guys are playing. And, and it's a lot harder to get a guy hit a ground ball on a, on a pitch at the letters than it is mm -hmm. at a pitch at the knees. So it, it's, been, it's been interesting to watch. I mean, forever it was, it was the split. Then it went to the cutter. Oh, the cutter. You know, now, <laughs> now it's the four-seam curveball combination, top of the zone four-seam curveball. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now is it going to go back to some other variation – to try and make the hitters catch up and it's a constant game but it's fun to it's fun to watch for me to see the evolution especially over the last 20 years as i've been paying a lot more attention to it yeah i mean look i could talk hitting baseball all day with you um but you know people's attention spans here are you know they're <laughs> small no offense Those to ones. the fans out there thank you guys for <laughs> watching this video but we got in the back queued up here this is August 31st, 2013. One of your last days with the last Twins. Day. The last day with the Twins. And we're facing you, Darvish, in Texas. Um, and this is a cool bet. I was here. I was playing in the game. Joe's Nathans comes into this game and closes us out, which is pretty cool, even though I did get a base hit off you, Joe, in the ninth inning because I looked that up. <laughs> uh, but let's uh, let's kind of cruise into the at-bat. Here we have Chris Herman just took him up top. 
Yeah, you Darvish was throwing a shutout to this point. Chris pumped him into the stand. So yeah, now the we got all uh, heater turns on it. Yeah, we got you up so, there two two in the seventh. Eighty six pitches. All, so this, so to me, Darvish threw. Sometimes they call it a cutter. Sometimes they call it a slider. To me, he just combined the two pitches and sometimes threw it harder than the other. But a cutter and a slider to me, unless the tilt is so much different, I just kind of grouped them in the same. Yeah. I knew they were both going to be breaking in towards me. So he threw, at this point in his career, he threw more slider cutter than he did four seam fastball. So this whole game, I was just, I was looking slider. I said, all right, at some point, you know, to me, hitting and trying to be a smart hitter is to look for the pitch, pitch you're most likely going to see. Now, when you don't know what that is, or it's an even across the board, your default is usually fastball because it's a lot easier to adjust to something slower than it is to look slow and adjust to something faster. But off him, I was confident at some point in this game, he was going to throw me a, he was going to throw me a slider. So we go through this at bat first pitch, I'm looking slider and, and I can tell by watching my at bat that I was looking slider. But you see, uh, why why do AJ, you say that? Are you just opening up a little bit? Or are you just the way I track it? It's not okay. If you show it, and I'll, I'll tell you. I'll All tell right, you what. We'll I start mean. it up here. He set up a way as part of the issue here, but see, I, my hands start towards the ball, but oh oh, I'm looking, I'm looking for something middle to come middle in, something that I can pull that I can get my barrel underneath and, and meet that break. So Fastball, non-competitive, but see there, you can see my take is soft there. It looks like I'm seeing the ball really well. In truth, all I'm doing is looking for 87 instead of 94. So my take is soft. My foot lands soft. I think it's the same thing on this pitch too is, is I'm looking off speed. So I'm letting that ball travel. I'm not worried about catching up to the fastball. Mm. So he missed the zone there. My hands don't move. It's, it's something that ball's moving away from me. I have no interest in swinging that pitch. So now I'm confident with how many sliders he throws that he's going to give me something breaking in towards me right here. He, he got away. I get, he got away with the first one. That's what I'm telling myself. Backdoor slider. He got away with that. Then yep. splitter, then heater. All and I way. wasn't looking to hit an oppo homer on it. I figure if it's cutter slider, he wants to get it, you know, under my hands or whatever it is. So if I'm looking for that backdoor slider, maybe I hit it, but that's not the location I was looking for that pitch. So number one, I was looking slider, but number two, I wasn't looking for slider anywhere in the zone i was looking for it in a, in a place where i felt like i could drive it so like that. take that one take the next two pitches now i'm sitting here confident that if he throws it to me i'm so while i'm standing there you can see me standing there i'm looking at my bat right mm -hmm. so for me and i did this subconsciously i think but i'm anticipating what that pitch is and what it's going to feel like coming off my bat before i even step in the batter's box so i'm, I'm seeing that ball you know, that mental game like I was talking about off the tee, I'm seeing that ball coming out of his hand before I even step in the batter's box. So that way when I see it in the game, I'm actually not surprised by it. It's what I was looking for. It's it's what I anticipated. So then I'm able to jump all over it. And, and you can tell that I was sitting on it just because of the timing and the balance. There was no hesitation of foot gets down. I'm looking for fastball. Oh, that's not a fastball. I'm going to adjust as the ball's on its way to a plate. This one, I was sold out to the slider here. And he um, throws it exactly where I was looking. I can tell, I love that you said, like, I can tell that you are sitting soft because your approach is soft. And yeah. there's a guy. The foot's landing, the head's not bouncing. I yeah. used to, when I would feel rushed, and I, and I actually texted this today to Reese Hoskins because he looks like a, he's a click too fast right now. The, the thing that I found that helped me the most when I was rushed was curveball BP. Like I had someone go in there and just throw me curveballs. It just slows everything down. You kind of get in a good space and you can see like kind of how you're setting up right now. You said, I'm looking soft. Everything is soft. And it kind of, like I said, just slows you down. And even if you're sitting soft, like you are, if he threw a heater dead middle, you're still going to get to it. Yeah, I think you, so too. You know, I talked to Tommy about that. Yeah. He said the year he had 50, he, he sat off speed the entire year. It helps a lot, man. It's a <laughs> weird thing to like try to like wrap your head around, but it's just because your approach uh, mimics what you're thinking. So Yeah, you slow down, then your eyes take over and you recognize pitches. All right, so 2-1, <clears throat> sitting soft. Are you going to get it? I think you are. <laughs> and I love this swing right here. Oh, everything about it is exactly what you're talking about. Just watch how calm you are. Like you wait on this pitch to get there, then bam. 
and it's not a swinging like if i miss this i'm not going to fall over my balance is good you know it's there i'm tracking the ball let it get deep it's it's one of those things where and then it's so pure when you get it oh just clicks bro and it's just it's such a good feeling i didn't know at the time that this is going to be my last homer as a twin <laughs> but it felt good i mean I, I was i went through a stretch this year this is 13 i went through a stretch this year of like two and a half months or something without hitting a homer and then all of a sudden I started to find my swing and I started to get hot and I was hitting a lot of homers at that time. So I was confident in my approach, but you see, you can see the timing is what I was talking about there. Mm -hmm. There's no hesitation of foot gets down, click half second recognition. It's foot gets down. I'm, I'm, I'm sold out right there. That's a slider. And then of course it's middle, middle people will say, Oh, if you're looking fastball, you'd hit that anyway. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I'm broken my bat on that pitch plenty of times when I'm, I'm, thinking fastball in i'm thinking 94 96 on the inner part of the plate then that's a rollover it's a broken bat whatever it is there i give my i give myself a chance to hit the pitch he was most likely to throw and that's the way i kind of looked at it a lot of times so that was a good feeling there that was it's, nice it's uh i don't know my I, I mean it's crazy the stuff that we can remember by watching stuff and and see even remember back to what, what we were thinking mentally at that time because I mean, as much as the game's physical, it's it's mental and, and what you feel. And I think that the best thing I ever heard was from Larry Walker. And he said, the only stat I ever worried about was going one for one my next at bat. <laughs> and if, like you, if you're able to simplify it that much, to it's know that... Short memory, it, love that. If you're three for three or over three, that fourth at bat is the only one that matters. It doesn't matter what you've done in those previous three at bats. Mm -hmm. And when you're going through a tough time, it is the absolute hardest thing to do not to let it snowball on you and not to sit there and let it just pile up and pile up because post game, you're over your last 18. How do you feel? Not you can't good. just sit there and go, I don't <laughs> care about those 18 at bats. You, you, you kind of have to answer the question. You have to talk about what you're feeling and I'm not seeing the ball well or whatever it is. Well, uh, you know, I've been watching, I feel like hitters have struggled in the early part of the of the season, the shortened season, Very much camp so. and everything else. And and it, it's hard because I just want to reach out and say, you know, the only at-bat that matters is the next one, not the last one. The only at-bat that matters is the one that's coming up because whether you go one for one or 0 for one, it's not going to erase the 10 for 20 or the 0 for 20. That's done. That's in the past. And the yes. quicker you can move on from that, and the quicker you can just focus on the next – at bat the next the process the next pitch and it's easier said than done it's probably the hardest thing i think to do in baseball is is be able to go at bat to at bat and not let the last one affect the next one so i think you should reach out man i'm telling you your your words carry weight you've done it and if i'm still playing and i'm slumping and i get a text from from morny it's gonna help me man but if you think about What's the what's the one thing that happens all the time when you're when you're struggling when you're going through a slump? You get advice from seven different people. Yeah, but you're not seven different people, bro. No, but it doesn't matter. It's one of those things. It's like how many more voices do you need to be able to figure out that once you start seeing the ball again, then I think if you get into specifics, if you're like, hey man, I see something you're doing, like maybe give this a try or or an adv advice like that that's very general, like hey, just like fuck whatever has happened the last two weeks like doesn't matter i mean that's like kind of what prince told me that i've remembered forever like don't worry about that dude like you'll see what kind of player you are at the end of the year and that gave me a lot of confidence there's some guys yeah there's some guys that you could reach out to that would that would yeah, appreciate that unsolicited advice isn't always the best uh <laughs> I, I, feel well. you. I feel you but just if it's from someone you don't want advice from yes but i think guys would like uh to hear from you so uh, I appreciate you coming on, man. That was like a master class in hitting. Um, is there anything that you want to plug? <laughs> no, I'm I don't good. know. You're not a plugger. I just thought I'd throw that out there to you. No social media for this guy. No, that's a good thing, man. But again, catch Justin um, on Fox Sports North uh, doing the Twins games along Dick Bremer. When are you back? When's the next one you're doing? September 4th or 5th. I have almost every game in September, so... Love we'll it. See, uh, we'll see once the kids go back to school and start working, and hopefully it's uh, right, pen and chase time and we get some good games. So I think I'm the twins are going to be doing all right at that time. So we'll see them, and then they got to get off. Uh, they got to get rid of the Yankees. We all know that. 
And we'll end it there because people are going to be really mad that I said that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Morney, thank you for coming on, dude. And again, always a pleasure catching up.